Okay, hi everyone. Uh, I am Michalis Papas. I am a senior engineer in virtualization at Open Synergy. And today I'll present our advancements in virtualization security with the use of unikernels and specifically show how the Cocos hypervisor can leverage the Unicard project to create highly isolated unikernel based services. I'll start with a brief introduction to the Cocos hypervisor and proceed to describe the security challenges caused by aggregating functionality on top of large monolithic guests. Um, we'll see how this aggregation is bad for security and highlight the need for component isolation. Uh, I'll move on to show how Unikernels provide a suitable platform for building isolated components and introduce the Unicaf project, which allows us to build highly specialized operating system images. Uh, we will focus on Unicaf's architecture and have a look at some data that shows uh, that the unikernels produced by Unicraft are characterized by small size, small memory footprint, and high performance. We will then have a closer look on how component isolation is an integral part of Cocos Hypervisor's architecture and see some additional features that complement this approach. Finally, uh, we will see how all these fit together with a case study on how we implement virtualization of trust execution environments with the assistance of unikernels. So the Cocos hypervisor or Cocos HV is a type one hypervisor that makes use of uh, hardware support for visualization provided by uh, the ARMv8 architecture. Its main focus is secure and safety critical automotive systems and it's certified as ASLB under the ISO 26262 standard. Um, the main purpose of uh, the Cocos hypervisor is to allow the consolidation of components of different criticality on the same SOC, which in practice means that you can run guests of different ASIL levels on the same hardware, and the hypervisor will provide guarantees for strong isolation and freedom from interference. Um, so strong isolation is critical for both security and safety, but uh, in reality, guests are rarely completely isolated from each other. And that's because of inter-VM communication um, that is required in nearly every practical use case for at least some of the guests. Um, I'll demonstrate the effects of inter-VM communication with an example. So consider um, a typical automotive setup with a Linux-based uh, instrument cluster and an Android-based uh, infotainment system, along with uh, an Autosar guest providing some other uh, ECU functionality. So in an ideal world, these guests would run in complete isolation from each other. And in this case, uh, the TCB of each guest will consist of the hypervisor. Um, in reality, however, um, safety-critical hypervisors are small, and additional functionality is uh, normally implemented by one or more privileged guests. In our example, we can think of uh, one PVM that provides some sort of visualization service to the IC and IVI guests, let's say maybe um, device visualization. Um, this normally um, introduces the requirement for inter-VM communication between the PVM and its clients. Um, which is usually implemented uh, over some primitives provided by the hypervisor. Um, because of inter-VM communication, the security of the PVM becomes critical, and that's because a compromise of the PVM can impact all the guests uh, this uh, PVM provides services to. So um, now the PVM becomes part of the TCB of its clients. Or, in other words, the IC and the AVI are part of the same trust domain. So you can see um, at the bottom of the diagram how the IC and the AVI now have to trust the hypervisor and the PVM as well. Um, notice, however, that the Autosar guest is completely unaffected by all this thanks to strong isolation guarantees provided by the hypervisor. So even if the other guests are fully compromised, the Autosar guest remains secure. So, as the PVM becomes part of the TCB for some guests, um, it must demonstrate a small attack surface. 
Um, this, however, is not the case with many deployments today, as uh, we can see privileged cases implemented over large monolithic operating systems such as Linux that come with a big attack surface. And even worse, these cases um, aggregate multiple services. And this is clearly bad for security, as it only takes one vulnerable service to gain access to the entire system. And we have seen multiple cases of CVEs describing VM escape attacks by exploiting vulnerabilities in device drivers. So a system compromise now um, affects all services running on the same guest and uh, consequently the superset of client VMs is now at risk. So this calls for a direction towards um, service disaggregation and of course this problem is widely recognized. Um, for example, you can see a paper published by the Zen project on how to improve Zen security through disaggregation. Um, our answer on how to achieve disaggregation is by leveraging the strong isolation provided by the hypervisor to compartmentalize each service to an isolated VM. Um, in, in the figure you can see how we can break down um, the um, large PVM into a set of specialized guests, one of which, one of each providing a single functionality. And this gives us an improved architecture with respect to security as we preserve a small TCB by minimizing the attack surface and limit the impact of compromise to a single service. Now, the question is whether that is possible. So traditionally, the addition of guests is considered expensive. So it's been avoided. And I would even go as far as um, arguing that the main force behind aggregation has been performance. Nowadays, however, the landscape has changed with automotive ECUs being deployed over powerful SOCs. For example, Rensa's Salvatore XS features eight ARM cores and four gigabytes of memory. And newer platforms exhibit even more powerful specifications. Um, nevertheless, uh, we still need a suitable operating system. So I put down some requirements. So we have seen that for our security requirements, we need an operating system that provides um, small, minimal images. For the performance reasons stated above, we also need these images to be lightweight. We would like to have some degree of modularity so that we can tailor down the applications to our requirements, whether they are minimal or feature rich. And finally, we would like to be able to port existing components with minimal effort. And it turns out that Unikernels provide a highly suitable tool for our criteria. So, Let's see what unikernels are. Um, unikernels are highly specialized uh, operating system images running on a single address space uh, constructed by library operating systems. So the idea is that the user gets provided with a set of libraries and selects the smallest set of them needed to implement the operating system constructs required by their application. Um, by specialized, uh, we mean that um, our unikernels execute a single application. And uh, this is the opposite of uh, the concept of traditional general purpose operating systems. Um, by single other space, uh, we mean that um, as there is only one application, there is no distinction, there is no need for distinction between user space and kernel space. So our application runs entirely in kernel space and in ARM, this is L1, of course. I will introduce now Unicraft, which is the Unikernel project we use uh, in the Cocos hypervisor. Um, Unicraft is a POSIX compliant library OS with a high degree of modularity provided under the BSD3 clause license. Um, when it comes to architecture, Unicraft implements uh, functional units as microlibraries and organizes microlibraries into library pools.
A very important feature of Unicraft is that it is fully libraryized, which means that everything is a library, and that includes the very core uh, operating system primitives. So on the diagram on the right, going bottom to top, uh, you can see that uh, one can choose between different architectures, then you have um, different platforms to choose from, um, such as KVM, Zen, or in our case, uh, the Cocos hypervisor. Um, moving up, you can see the main library pool that um, provides things like schedulers, memory allocators, network stacks, or even different flavors of a standard library, um, or even runtimes for high-level languages. The workflow for uh, building an application is configuring Unicraft using kconfig to select a set of libraries uh, and setting various parameters and developing or porting an application that uses uh, these libraries. Then um, everything is linked together into a single binary, which is uh, the resulting uh, unikernel image. So from what we can see, Unicraft allows us to build highly specialized and uh, minimal uh, operating system images. And being fully libraryized, it gives us uh, a lot of control. In our domain, we are um, mainly interested in very minimal images, but there have been occasions where using um, a wider set of libraries has been uh, required to port um, third-party applications. So having the flexibility to do that is important. And being POSIX compliant means that it is possible to port applications from other operating systems with a reasonably small effort. So let's have a look at uh, Unicraft's performance. Uh, the graphs here come originally from the Unicraft project and the first graph uh, shows some comparisons of image size of common applications built uh, as unikernels with Unicraft. Uh, and we can see the resulting images are very small with the total image size ranging from a few hundreds of kilobytes uh, up to less than two megabytes. And uh, with additional optimizations, uh, we can uh, achieve even smaller images. In terms of uh, idle memory usage, we can see a comparison between individual Unicraft applications and various um, Linux images. And by a look uh, at the numbers, we can see that the difference can be as large as an order of magnitude. Of course, uh, memory usage depends, depends on the application um, workload. So these numbers can change depending on the application, but you can still get an idea of how big the difference can be. Regarding boot times, uh, again, we can uh, we compare common applications running on uh, Unicraft against uh, Linux images. And the difference here is significant uh, as most uh, Unicraft applications boot in less than uh, 100 milliseconds. The last graph on the bottom right shows a comparison of uh, Lite VM, which is based on work preceding Unicraft against Docker, booting on a 64 core server. Um, we won't be looking uh, at Docker uh, so much as it's uh, not relevant to our case, uh, but rather on how it is possible to boot a large number of Unix kernels uh, on a given core while maintaining high performance. So. The conclusion is that uh, Unicraft provides us with an environment that allows us to build highly performant operating system images, which makes the addition of guests no longer expensive. At this point, I'll switch back to the Cocos hypervisor and discuss an important part of our architecture, which is Cocos hypervisor extensions. Um, Cocos hypervisor extensions allow us to delegate functionality from the hypervisor to extension VMs. And that is because in order to fulfill its security and safety requirements, the hypervisor core implements uh, only the smallest set of features required to provide isolated visualization. Um, Non-essential functionality is implemented in extension VMs, which are executing in a separate address space from the hypervisor core. And this separation uh, functionality allows avoiding cascading failures as attacks on extension VMs or uh, malfunction on extension VMs don't interfere with the execution of other guests or the hypervisor itself. 
So hypervisor extensions are an important concept as they allow the hypervisor to preserve its small TCB and they additionally provide high flexibility and modularity to the whole architecture as users can pick extensions to tailor the hypervisor functionality to match their um, use case. Another feature that complements um, hypervisor extensions is synchronous exception forwarding. Um, synchronous exception forwarding allows dropping synchronous exceptions triggered by a VM in the hypervisor and uh, dispatching requests to extension VMs for handling. So the Cocos hypervisor can be configured to trap exceptions of this kind for a number of guests. Um, when an exception occurs, um, execution of the guest that triggered the exception is blocked. The hypervisor traps the exception and dispatches a request to a pre-configured extension VM. The extension VM processes the request, it notifies the hypervisor with a response and uh, the hypervisor updates the aborting guest context and resumes its execution. Okay, um, so with all the background covered, I am now ready to provide an example uh, that shows how all these uh, work together. So this example shows how we can use a unikernel based extension VM to provide uh, TE virtualization services. I will first provide some back background on um, TEs. So TE is uh, an acronym for Trusted Execution Environment. And trusted execution environments provide platforms with um, a secure environment that can be used to protect secrets and perform operations on them. The idea is that if the system is compromised, the secrets remain protected by the TE. Um, common examples of Functionalities implemented by TEs are key management, anti-rollback, uh, secure storage, DRM, and secure credential processing. So in this example, we will be focusing on uh, Opti, which is a TE developed uh, by Linaro. So Opti's execution model is uh, governed by the uh, global platform uh, standards and the standard specifies uh, client applications executing in a rich OS environment that communicate with uh, trusted applications running in the trusted execution environment. And in ARM-based architectures, uh, there is hardware support uh, for that, which is Trust Zone, and which provides two execution contexts, the normal world and the secure world. In the normal world, you have your usual operating system or uh, multiple uh, VMs in the hypervisor. And in the secure world, we have the secure OS, uh, which is, in this case, um, Opti. Uh, at any given time, the processor can execute either in the normal world or in the secure world. And communication is usually invoked by the normal world. Um, issuing a secure monitor call or SMC, which causes the processor to switch to the secure world and process the request. Um, nowadays, TEs are becoming ubiquitous in various types of devices, and um, so is the requirement for uh, virtualization support. So major TEs now start providing this feature. Uh, virtualization support normally requires some assistance from the hypervisor and in Opti that involves uh, um, appending each uh, request with a VM ID and performing some memory translations, um, security checks, uh, some context maintenance and so on. Uh, Opti refers to the virtualization layer as the Opti mediator and uh, there is a reference implementation uh, in the Zen hypervisor. The architecture can be seen uh, in the figure on the right. So here we have two guests issuing requests to the secure OS and all requests are relayed through the Opti mediator 
uh, which is implemented as part of the hypervisor. Now, the problem with implementing uh, the TE visualization layer in the hypervisor is that it doesn't scale very well uh, in safety critical systems. And that is because in the ARM ecosystem there are several trusted execution environments. And although um, all of them implement visualization support in a similar way, that is with the help of a visualization layer, currently there is no standard governing uh, TE visualization that is implemented by uh, vendors. So the result is that the specifics of the visualization layer is uh, very much dependent on the TE implementation and the complexity of this layer again varies very much between uh, different trusted execution environments. Uh, so this means that uh, a hypervisor needs to provide a different implementation for every TE it needs to support and when it comes to um, safety critical hypervisors uh, that uh, need to be certified, um, this can be a problem. So um, our approach is to remove the complexity from the hypervisor and uh, outsource it to an extension VM uh, by leveraging the synchronous exception forwarding feature uh, that allows us to trap SMCs uh, happening on the um, guests and forward them for handling to an extension VM. The architecture is shown um, on the diagram. So um, the, a guest will uh, issue an SMC um, through the kernel driver. Uh, the hypervisor will trap the SMC. It will um, issue a request to the TE mediator, which will uh, perform uh, all tasks uh, required for uh, visualization. And then it will forward uh, the SMC to the um, secure monitor, which will in turn dispatch it to the um, secure OS. When it comes to the extension VM, we implement this guest as a Unicraft-based unikernel, which results into a nearly bare metal image, which is exactly what we need for this type of application. The image consists just uh, of a few libraries. So going from bottom to top, we have the library that implements the architecture part, uh, in our case, ARCH64. Then we have the Cocos HV platform library that implements the core part of our guest. Um, then we have uh, NoLibc, which implements a subset of the standard library for applications that don't require full implementation. And the Cocos HV, uh, the Cocos hypervisor extension library that implements the communication protocol with the hypervisor core. On the top, we have the OptiMediator application that implements uh, the main logic. One last thing I would like to point out here is scheduling. So as there may be several guests running on the system, whether these are regular guests or hypervisor extensions, we'd like to ensure that our extension VM consumes as little scheduling time as possible. And we achieve that by adding the extension VM to the hypervisor scheduler when there is a synchronous exception to process and removing it by uh, from the hypervisor's scheduler as soon as handling is complete. Now remember, uh, when uh, we introduced the uh, synchronous exception forwarding, um, that when a guest causes an exception, uh, execution is stopped for that guest until the exception is uh, handled. Um, this to combine means that um, the extensions uh, VM effectively steals the scheduler slot of the VM that caused the exception for the time it requires to handle the exception and returns it back to uh, its execution. Uh, it returns it back to um, the hypervisor when it's time for uh, the execution of the aborting guest to be resumed. Uh, this allows us to maintain high performance as uh, we keep the number of scheduled guests constant.
Um, coming to conclusions, we saw how component aggregation uh, imposes security risks and we highlighted the requirement for compartmentalization and isolation and we saw that unikernels are a suitable platform for that purpose. We introduced Unicraft and we saw how it can help us produce small specialized guests of high performance and low resource usage. And we had a closer look on how the Cocos hypervisor achieves isolation with the uh, hypervisor extensions and synchronous exception forwarding. Uh, looking ahead, uh, there is an obvious question on whether it is possible to isolate every single uh, service or component. And the truth is that there are um, several challenges ahead. For instance, there are cases of very complex device drivers uh, that uh, also depend on equally complex subsystems that would require a lot of work to port to a unikernel. And clearly in these cases, it's probably a better idea to stick to Linux. Um, when it comes to scalability, what we have learned from microkernels uh, that uh, feature a similar architecture is that scaling up involves uh, its own challenges as well. Uh, and based on the above, it should all come down to achieving the right balance. So this is it. Thank you for attending this talk and I hope you found it interesting.